last video, we looked at the uh, block that had the Free Methodist churches in it, and you can see it here on the right. But as you look over here uh, to the left, you can see uh, part of the Blue Water Bridge complex. This is what it looks like today, according to Google Maps. But uh, going back to 1938, this is what it looked like. The front part uh, of the building was all offices. Up behind that, there were bay doors that allowed trucks in with livestock. And they had pens inside there that they would uh, sometimes keep the livestock in. And occasionally, uh, getting out of church, you could get some very unpleasant smells because it was right across the street. And looking at this photo, you can't see it very well, but uh, in this photo here, people coming out of church, and by the way, that was my Sunday school teacher, Orpha. And, uh, but looking over to the left, you can see those bay doors. Prior to the opening of the Blue Water Bridge, international travelers from the area depended on steam ferries to carry them safely between Port Huron and Sarnia. In 1891, the Port Huron and Sarnia Ferry Companies was formed, and it wasn't until 1926 that owners James McTaggart and Fred Newton employed the steamships the Aereo, city of Port Huron, and the city of Sarnia. They needed the three ferries because usually there was quite a lineup to get on, and the uh, steamships uh, could only take about 25 cars at a time. This was at the foot of Grand River, right near the White Star Dock. And this photo was taken in Sarnia, a lineup waiting for the ship uh, for Port Huron. And here's a couple of photographs uh, that we have of the aerial. The second steamship was the city of Port Huron. And we have a couple of photos of that. This one here, I took off the internet, and so uh, there's a watermark on it, but what a great photograph. Uh, very, very clear photograph as well. I also found this photograph just this week, not near as clear, but it gives you an idea of what it looked like when the cars were coming off of the ferry, and this is also the city of Port Huron Ferry. And last but not least, there was the city of Sarnia. The video segments that you're about to see in this video were supplied by Kip Cuthbert. It's always amazing to see a film from this early era. You can see the cars being driven on to the car ferry. Uh, this is the city of Port Huron Ferry. And you can also see the cars that are waiting in line to get on. There's quite a crowd of them. And here we see the ferry going across with the Sarnia side, and I think almost all of us can remember that hill when we got off the ferry. It's, uh, we were probably taking a different type of ferry, though. We were probably taking the Landycraft ferry, but still the same hill there. The first Blue Water Bridge was opened in 1938, but years before that, probably eight years before that, uh, Maynard Smith also had a plan and came very close to succeeding to building a bridge in Port Huron. I covered the first Blue Water Bridge briefly in video number 12, and, uh, but I did cover Mr. Maynard Smith uh, efforts in the Egyptian video, Egyptian Smith video in 177. So if you want to know more about that, you can go back and look at that one. I'm trying not to repeat myself. Most all this information you'll see here is new with the exception of maybe two or three pictures. Mr. Smith wasn't the only person that submitted plans for a new bridge. Lyle Harrington also submitted a plan. I found this article and the caption on this article reads like this. If the bridge is proposed by Maynard D. Smith, Port Huron, Detroit businessman, and John Lyle Harrington, New York and Kansas City bridge engineer, had been constructed, they would have been built across Sarnia Bay to connect the business districts of Port Huron and Sarnia as shown above. Both cuts have been made from artist drawings prepared in 1927 by Mr. Smith and Mr. Harrington, the rival promoters, neither of whom were able to carry through their plans for a St. Clair River crossing. At the top is the Smith proposed bridge. It was drawn by Jacob Strauss, Chicago, one of the leading bridge engineers of the country. 
The American approach would start at Grand River Avenue and run parallel to the river to a point near Pine Grove Park, where it would make a right turn to cross the river over a suspension span. The Canadian approach would have crossed Sarnia Bay. At the bottom is the proposed Harrington Bridge, which would have followed the same route as the Smith Bridge. Under this plan, the American end of the bridge would have been hook-shaped. The span across the river would have been of the suspension type with the Canadian approach running across Sarnia Bay. It would have been 28 feet wide with a 20-foot roadway and two sidewalks, each four foot wide. This width would have permitted only two traffic lanes. The Blue Water Bridge has three traffic lanes. The suspension section of the Harrington Bridge would have been 1,130 feet long. An estimated cost was between $3 million and $4 million. The estimated cost of the Smith Bridge was about the same. The turning point in building a bridge came soon after when the Smith deal fell through. A new bridge commission next moved to secure federal and state government agreement to building the American approach to the bridge and the building of the Canadian approach by the Ontario and Dominion governments. The idea was successful. The only remaining problem was how to finance the center or main span reaching from one shore to the other and what to do about competition from the existing ferry line, a very successful enterprise for years because of the great amount of traffic between Port Huron and Sarnia. The answer to this problem came through the proposal of a revenue bond issued to be paid from toll income of bridge users. State and federal government approved the idea and the bond issues were sold. The idea was once the bonds were paid off for that span between the two countries, that the bridge would be turned over to the public and there would no longer be a toll charge. The caption on this photograph says Howard E. Hill, director of the State Highway Department, points to the agreement made in 1937 between the State Bridge Commission, the State Highway Commissioner, and the Minister of Highways of the Province of Ontario calling for the Blue Water Bridge to be toll-free after the construction bonds on the bridge were paid off. Well, we all know how that worked out. We also know how they handled the ferry boat problem. They paid them off. $650,000 here you can see on the very top line. Of course, in today's dollars, that's about $11,600,000. So I think they made out all right. You can see from this bridge diagram on the approach on the American side that the entrance came off of Pine Grove and the exit went on to Elmwood Street and you could go either way, west or east. These were the four men that were responsible for building the Blue Water Bridge. I don't mean the physical labor, but the brains behind the physical labor. All four of these men were engineers, one responsible for the American approach one responsible for the main span construction, one responsible for the main span operations, and the other one was a consulting engineer, I guess was voting from back and forth. The men responsible for the physical labor on the bridge were men like these. The building of the bridge starts with piers. You have to sink those piers as a foundation. And in this photograph here, you can see the very first two piers that they had for the Blue Water Bridge. In this artist drawing, you can see the pier. The steel at the base of the piers is called cutting edges, as earth is removed from under the pier by means of a clam bucket, which is sent down through an eight-foot opening in the center of the pier. The mass of concrete settles downward. The cutting edges or shoe facilitate the operation, helping to cut through the earth and force it to the center of the inside opening where the bucket picks it up. As the pier settles, Additional concrete is added at the top. The film you've been looking at was actually done on the Blue Water Bridge, so we're very fortunate to have that. And here is the official photograph of those two same piers. And as you can see, the piers are in two different uh, stages of development. One already has a cement outer coating on it. Here we see one of the divers for the piers. 
and the caption reads, W.G. Sheldon, Saginaw Diver, is shown, donning his diving suit preparatory to a descent to the bottom of one of the Blue Water International Bridge main span piers on the American side of St. Clair River. Sheldon directs excavation of earth under the water-filled piers. He was overcome by bends, a severe pain caused by failure to decompress when he came to the surface too quickly. And it would seem that he wasn't the only one. Fourth diver ill of caisson disease. The caisson was actually the part below the water level and the pier I was called above the water level. And here you can see the piers going up. Here you can see the two foundations completed, both on both sides of the river. I love this picture because it's kind of a foggy picture, misty, and it looks like two long sentinels on guard on each side of the river. But then again, maybe it's just two pieces of cement. Once the foundation was set, the building of the superstructure could begin. And in this uh, newspaper article from December of 1937, you can see that it begins to have a photograph of it. And we have several photographs and we'll go through them fairly quickly, but they're good photographs and it shows the building of the superstructure on the bridge. I love this photograph of these two girls looking up in amazement at this bridge being built. But it wasn't just girls back then. Adults were looking on in amazement as well. I mean, today we think nothing of a bridge being built. They could tell me a bridge 20 miles long, 30 miles long. I wouldn't think twice about it. I believe they can do almost anything today. But back then, this was an amazing achievement. Well, the bridge looked like it was done. But it wasn't. That was just a skeleton. We had to put some flesh on those bones. And so the construction began for the pavement. The question I have in this photograph is, well, first of all, what is that man and woman doing there, looking straight over the edge down at the water? Did they just happen to be passing by and says, oh, let's go look at the bridge? And secondly, where's Osho when you need them? And here they are putting the finishing touches on the roadway. And finally, the bridge is finished. Join me in my next video and we'll finish up this segment on the Blue Water Bridge and we'll look at the dedication and the celebration of the bridge.